Good morning, everyone. It is so good to see all of you. What a beautiful Sunday morning. How good to be together in the house of the Lord on this beautiful day. We are going to start the service off this morning singing about God's miracle power. Why don't you stand and join us and as we get started. Sit down. Don't sit down. 
promise I'll be quick. Hey, beautiful day today. Everybody feels good. Let's really enjoy this and praise God for beautiful weather, beautiful life. And uh, I know we all bring in stuff. Got all, we've all got our stuff. But bring it in, present it to God this morning, and let him redeem it, make something good come from it. If you're with us for the first time, we'd love for you to stop by the welcome desk, get a small gift of our appreciation for your attendance today. If you've been here for 150 times, we're glad you're here too. So let me pray, and we'll, get, uh, we'll continue. Father, thank you for just a beautiful day. This is the day you've made. Help us to rejoice and be glad in it, and receive with gratitude and not complaint. We just uh, want to come into your presence and encounter you this morning and be transformed as a result. Help us to pay attention to the words that we sing. Help us to engage in communion and offering and all the other things that we do that uh, are meaningful for you and for us. So just guide us today. We thank you for Tim and pray that you'll be over him as he uh, brings your word to us today. We thank you for empowering us with your spirit, and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh 
think you guys know this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. veils his lovely face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil on Christ's solid rock I stand all of the ground is sinking sand all with our voices. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, we thank you that our hope, our life, our strength, our home, all of it is found in you. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Here in the power of Christ, we stand. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. For our prayer time this morning, I'm going to use a visual. When I show this to you, I'm not doing it to be sacrilegious. I don't want anyone to walk away this morning being offended. But it's just for scale, right? So if we can put the picture of Lego Jesus up on the screen this morning. Again, this is not to be just, you know, I just don't want anybody to be offended by Lego Jesus. But, but here's my thing lately for me, and I've had to go kind of go back to some things that, um, some studies, some readings, some things where um, it's just taking me back to the real Jesus. There was a period there for a while where I would get on my knees or I would pray and I would pray about things and walk away. <clears throat> I was still shaken. I was still distracted. And it made me feel like what I prayed to at that point for that period of time was something much smaller <clears throat> than that real Jesus. I felt like sometimes I was just praying to a Lego Jesus. I don't know if you ever feel that way. But I've got some things that I've been looking at, and it's one of the things that it talks about is just coming back to pure and simple uh, Jesus. And so this morning when we get ready to pray, and we're going to pray for some specific groups this morning, let's pray to the Jesus that was there at creation. Let's pray to the Jesus that came in that manger in a humble way. Let's pray to the Jesus that touched the leper. Let's pray to the Jesus. This is my favorite one right now, is that he stood toe-to-toe with Satan and didn't back down. Let's pray to the Jesus that went to that cross because of how much he loved you and how much he loved me. Let's pray to that Jesus that came out of that tomb that day. Let's pray to the Jesus that can raise the dead. Guys, that's not Lego Jesus. That's the real thing. And so this morning when we pray, I want to pray for some very specific groups. The very first group that I really want you to envision in your mind are our young kids, our people, that are being raised by and in situations that Jesus isn't even in the picture. God, the Heavenly Father, is not even there. And we have a whole bunch of kids living in crisis and in crisis situations. And that's why it's so important what Heather and Brandon do here on Wednesdays and Sundays. And it's, that's why it's so important for us that as adults and grown people, that when we come in here, we're seeking out these kids and looking for opportunities to really be around them. Um, because the kids that I see in school right now are just in crisis mode with nowhere to turn, not even a Lego Jesus. 
So that's up to us. There's a second group of people out there that right now are looking to Instagram and TikTok. And in, in America, I don't know if you realize this, but in some countries, the algorithm that the put, they put out there are really positive and great images of, of scientists and mathematicians and, and service projects. But in America, our TikTok and our Instagram is full of junk. It's just junk. And there are a whole lot of young adults and young people, maybe even older people, that we watch that, and that's, that's what we're absorbing into us, and it affects how we live. Then there's a whole group of people, guys, that don't even have any idea who that real Jesus is. And so let's take some time to pray for them this morning as well. No more Lego Jesus. Let's go to the real thing. Gracious Heavenly Father, this morning we know as we sit here who the real Jesus is. Thank you for your word that shows us that. Thank you for the truth that's in your word. And dear Heavenly Father, we want to pray this morning especially for our kids, uh, the kids that are here in this building right now, the kids that are in this community. And dear Heavenly Father, they need you. They need to know what truth is and that there is real truth. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to pray for people who um, are absorbing so much of this culture and this world that they don't even know what real is, um, what real friendships are, what uh, even reality is. And we pray that somehow, some way, Sherwood Oaks is, is a part of that, that ministry to show them real love and real caring um, and the real you. And Heavenly Father, as always, we're coming to you because we want to be a part of your kingdom work that shows who God is and the love that he has for us and who that real Jesus is. Heavenly Father, this morning, I just pray that you'll change our perspectives a little. Help us to see the real Jesus and not something any smaller. Amen. Good morning. I thought there might be a little video up there, but I don't see it yet. So we're just going to ignore the video. You remember what it looks like? It goes from wintertime to summertime. It's very promising and hopeful. Today, look what we have outside of the windows. We don't need a video. We have sunshine and blue skies. Isn't that amazing? Can we just be thankful for that for just a moment? <clears throat> I mean, that was moderately thankful. I hope, <laughs> hope God gets the idea. Um, maybe you can work on that the rest of the day. When I was growing up, one of the place, favorite places for us to play was in the barn. The barn was filled with hay bales. Now, nowadays, farmers don't even take time with the little square bales. But back in the day, that's we were poor. That's all we had. We had a, a, a square baler, and we had these hay bales, and we'd stack them up in the barn, and we spent summers just building tunnels and houses and all kinds of stuff with those, those square bales. Anyone know what I'm talking about when I say that? Yes. How many of you guys were also barn dwellers when you were uh, youth? Yeah, we loved, loved that. It always put me in mind when we're building those of the little pig. Remember him? who was sent out along with his two brothers to make a life for himself. And, and so he builds a house and he builds it out of straw out of hay and those hay bales. And of course, what happens? The big bad wolf has his eye on the pig and he goes to the pig and he says, hey, open up pig. I want to come in. And the pig says, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. The wolf says, well, I'm going to huff and puff until I blow it in. And so he huffs and puffs. And what happens? The house blows apart. The second little pig, of course, what's he build his house with? Sticks. He goes to find some sticks. I mean, these are horrible building materials, but guys. If you're thinking about building a home, do not take instruction from the, the first two little pigs. Of course, what happens? The same thing. Huff and puff, and the house blows up, and, and now this little pig, along with his brother, they're running for their lives, and they go to the third brother, who has had the foresight and maybe the wisdom to build his house out of something besides straw and sticks. He builds his house out of bricks. And when the wolf gets there and says, uh, open the door, and those three little pigs are like, okay, we got this. Well, the one does. The two others are traumatized from their previous experiences. It says, now by the hair of my chinny chin chin. The wolf says, I'm going to huff and puff and blow your house in. And what's he do? He huffs and he puffs and he huffs and he puffs and the little brick house stands firm. As followers of Jesus, we live in a world that's full of wolves knocking out the door, huffing and puffing, let me in, let me in, let me in. We've got failing systems. we got... Our kids, I love that prayer time with, uh, uh, with Darren, just praying for our kids who are living in a very difficult world right now. 
got a scary future. We have some scary futures in front of us. Increasing hostility to what we would consider biblical morality. New beliefs, rejection of old truths. Our world can feel like those pig houses, shaky and insecure. Like the wolf is at the door, let me in, let me in, let me in. We can say, ooh, not by the hair of our chinny chin chin, if we can muster that much. Because most of us are traumatized by our previous experience where our houses were built on something very insecure. And when the winds and the storms came, we saw our lives implode or explode. But Jesus says, Paul says in Colossians, that Jesus is at work in us and he is redeeming all of those things. We do not live in our traumatic past anymore. We now live in this new place where God is using even the huffing and puffing to build in us something new. He is redeeming. That's the work. That's the word the Bible used to talk about taking things that are on the face of it difficult and maybe even bad and God doing something good and eternal with it. This is sort of a redemptive act here. So Paul says to the, the Colossians, we're going to get into it in just a little bit. He goes, you need to keep your focus on the right place, not on Lego Jesus, but on real Jesus. And if you keep your focus on him, you don't falter, you don't waver in keeping your focus on him, then you are going to, you're going to ride the huffing and puffing out. It is going to have no effect on you. So if you've got your Bibles and you want to turn to Colossians, I would encourage you to um, open up your Bible app if you've got that, and we're going to dig in. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We're thankful for Paul, who in all of his stuff remained faithful to the call that you placed on his life. And he used that call, you used him in that call to encourage not just the church at Colossae, not just the church at Corinth, but the church at Bedford. And today we are the recipients of your grace in Paul. You redeemed Paul's life so that we might have life here too. What an amazing way you work. As we open your word, instruct us from it in Jesus' name, amen. So if you've not been with us for the last couple of weeks, you're, you're, you've, not, you've missed a lot. I'm not going to say you've not missed anything. You have missed a lot. But I'm going to catch up just real quick. And this is synopsis. So Paul, first of all, in chapter 1 of Colossians, greets the Colossians. He's never met these guys. They're strangers to him. But he greets them and he prays for them this beautiful, beautiful prayer. He says, may you bear fruit in every good work as you grow in the knowledge of God through Christ. This is an amazing prayer. It's a prayer that all of us need to lean into as we pray for one another. Then he unpacks this beautiful picture of Jesus, who this, this Christ is, that he's, he's praying that they grow into and bear much fruit in. He says, he's not a Lego Jesus. He's not a little guy. He's not just the guy dressed in old-fashioned clothes with nice sayings. That's not the Jesus that I'm pointing you to. He says, I'm pointing you to Jesus the Christ. And Christ is a big word here. It's not a cuss word. It's a cosmic word. And that cosmic word is he is not only the Jesus of Nazareth, but he is the Jesus who, who was at the beginning. He is the word and the logos of God. In verse 16, it says, for in him, in him, all things were created. Everything was created. Everything. There was nothing that exists that was not created by him. Things in heaven, things in earth, things that you can see, things that are visible, things that are invisible, everything, thrones, powers, rulers, authorities, presidents, everything runs and was created through him. All things have been created through him and for him, Paul says to the Colossians. Now, here's the deal for us. This is what changes everything. For us, this same Christ has redeemed you and all your stuff and brought you into himself in a new way and you're part of a new thing, the church. And he is the head over the church. And now Paul says something crazy. You, with all your stuff and your past and your nonsense and your embarrassing stuff, you now are part of God's plan for eternity his cosmic plan for the world and the universe and everything he created. He says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Now, I got a little pushback from that last week because um, where is Tammy? Tammy's not here this morning, but Tammy said, I just don't know. I've always taught that God doesn't really need us. And in one sense, she's absolutely right, isn't she? God can accomplish anything he wants. He doesn't need me or Nate or Joby to do that. However, God has intended to not operate that way. 
His intention is that he needs you. We talked about Christ is counting on you as you count on Christ. So Christ in you, the hope of glory, you matter to the eternal scheme of things. And the Colossians said, that's, that's great. That's great. We love all that. But there's also this crazy stuff happening in our world, and there's lots of huffing and puffing going on. And Paul says, listen, if Christ is in you and you are in Christ, then you've got this. So in the very first uh, verse that we're going to look at today, Colossians chapter 2, verses 5, we're going to go all the way through 10. Um, you know what? Let's stand up together. Let's read this out. You've been sitting for a little bit. Um, rested your eyes. You rested your feet um, and rested your eyes maybe if you've closed them. But now open your eyes, stand to your feet, and let's read this together. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it. That no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. And if your Bibles are open, that line right there is one I want you to underline. He is the head over every power and authority. And if you need to underline every a couple of times, just so you don't forget it, I'm going to encourage you to do that. You can be seated. Paul begins by saying to the Colossians, yeah, there's huffing and puffing, but you've got this. The outside forces are strong, but you've got this. He says, I wish I could be with, there, with you to tell you this face to face, but what I'm hearing from um, uh, your, our emissary there from Colossae is that, that you, guys are, you guys understand this. It's so encouraging, Paul says. He says, you're disciplined and you're firm of faith, this resolve. And this is our military terms here. If you've ever served in the military, you know what discipline and resolve are. You know how important it is to accomplish the task, the commission that God, uh, that has been given to you. So he says, you're disciplined. And what does that mean? That means all of you aren't running off on your own sense, uh, your own direction. You're not all doing your own thing. You're working together as a unit. You're disciplined and you're firm of faith. You're resolved you're, and you're firm of faith. Um, you're keeping your eyes not on the wolf at the door, but you're keeping your eyes on Jesus. A lot of times we get caught up with the wolf at the door. But Paul says, no, that's not, that's not keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus. That's not resolved in your faith. Resolved in your faith is keeping your eyes fixed firmly on Jesus. He goes, because of that, you're doing that. So keep, keep on living there. He says, just as you received Christ, keep living your life in him. Now, how did you receive Christ? You receive Christ by, by trusting in his grace and resting in his power. It was nothing to do with you. It wasn't your goodness. Paul makes that clear in other places. It's nothing you did. It's all about God's grace and God's power. He received you. He accepted you. He loved you. He brought you in by his grace. And now you are just resting in his power, letting God do what only God can do. He says, stay there in that place, resting in his grace and trusting in his power, trusting in his grace and resting in his power. And what's going to happen? You're going to find yourself growing deeper and you're going to go taller. He says, you're going to be rooted. Your life's going to get very firm and stable. Living in God's grace will get you into a place where you are, no matter what's going on around you, you're healthy and you're bearing fruit. The psalmist said it this way. He is like a tree planted by streams of living water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In the summertime here, it can get pretty dry and the leaves can get kind of crispy. But Paul says to the Colossians, if you remain resting in his power, trusting in his grace, you're going you're gonna to look like a tree that's planted by the water. 
no matter what's going on around in the other areas, that, that tree that's right there by the source of water is always looking good. It's always doing what it's supposed to do. It's bearing fruit. Its leaves are green. It's a, it's a source of shade and comfort to those around us. And it says, if you're resting in his power, trusting in his grace, that's what your life is going to be like. You're going to be able to weather storms. You're going to be able to weather droughts because of you're, you're rooted in him. So you're going deep. But he says you're also going up. He uses this architectural term. You're, you're being built up like a, like a building. He says you're, you're, if you live in God's grace, if you're right there where you need to be in Jesus, then you're going to be going upwards. You're, you're, doing, you're becoming something that the Spirit is building, not just individually. So this is, I think, the world I lived in growing up was, was it was all about me. And there was these constant checks on how I was doing with Jesus. Was I praying enough? Was I in, in, in my Bible enough? Was I going to church enough? Was I doing enough good stuff um, for, for the neighbors or for the community? And that is absolutely a marker of whether how we are growing and how we are rooted. How is our lives personally being exhibited? But Paul doesn't stop there. He says, here's the deal, guys. You've been brought into something more than just you. If you think this is all about you, then the focus is on you. And you are diminishing Jesus when the focus is all on you. He says, here's the deal. You've been brought into something bigger. You've been brought into this, this church. And, and in Corinthians, he, or Peter talks about this. He says, you are like living stones being built up into a spiritual house of worship. Together, you are being built up. Each of you are stones that's being added to the entire structure, being raised up. It says, this is growing in Christ. Together you're being made into something stronger and grander and bigger than the individual parts. By yourself, you're a stone on the ground. Together you are a magnificent temple of worship to the Holy Spirit. Staying in this place of God's grace will keep you thankful, he says. You're going to be overflowing with gratitude. One of the key markers of maturity in Christ Let's just say one of the key markers of maturity in general is gratitude. Have you noticed that? I'm surveying the room to see who's in the room right now. But I will tell you this, that when you were a young kid, you were not as grateful as you are now that you're in your 30s and 40s. Can you just recognize that? When we are immature, we think the world exists for our purposes. Anyone remember that time in your life? Hopefully you're not still there. Hopefully you've moved out of that. But when we are young, we think the world exists for us. And we are shocked when we discover that other people have lives themselves. They have whole stories going on that we know nothing about. And we realize, oh, I'm not the center of the universe. Now, if, if you still think you are, then you are immature. Because the sign of maturity, spiritual maturity, is gratitude. And Paul says, listen, when you're being rooted in Christ, when you're growing in Christ, the natural byproduct of that is you're going to mature and you're going to be thankful for everything God has done in your life and is doing in your life. Gratitude is an indication of humility, of meekness. And Jesus says that the meek will be the ones who will inherit the earth. Be thankful. Because where true thankfulness exists, it, it always overflows. It builds on itself. There's a gushingness to gratitude. And Paul says this, this is what it means. When we are resting in his power and trusting in his grace, we're going to become so aware of what God has done and is doing, we cannot help but be thankful. And he says this, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies. He says, don't let anyone drag you back to this idea of Jesus and, we talked about this last fall. Do you remember that, that sermon series? The Jesus and is the stuff that we tack on as Christians oftentimes to Jesus. 
So um, Paul, when he's talking to the Colossians, is dealing with a culture that has both Jews and pagan Gentiles sort of running the culture. The Christians are definitely in the minority in this world that, that Paul is writing to. And so these Christians are, are living in a world where they're being pressured on one side to observe all sorts of weird dietary laws and religious ceremonies and stuff that they've got to do to make themselves worthy, to receive God's grace. Um, on the other side, they're dealing, I think Alan talked about this, they're dealing with a weird pagan culture that, that has this weird angelology where they, they, they worship angels and they pray to angels and angels give them instruction and wisdom from God. And so there's this weird thing about angels going on here. And, and Paul says, listen, these are, these are hollow and deceptive philosophies. Now the first one, hollow. Hollow simply means there's nothing there. So if you remember in, um, I think it's the Corinthians, Paul talks about uh, to the Corinthians, he goes, you guys are really in an uproar about whether you can eat meat that's been offered in the, in the temple markets that would be used for worship to idols, or you don't touch that stuff. You guys are really, really, really upset about this, and it's causing some tension between you. Paul says, here's what you need to know. They're powerless. So do what you're going to do, but don't make a big deal about it. And if you can avoid offending people, don't do that. Don't offend people unnecessarily. But those things are powerless. Do or don't do. And Paul says this is sort of the idea that some of those philosophies are powerless. You want to have a Christmas tree? Put up a Christmas tree. If you think Christmas trees have pagan ancestry, don't put up a Christmas tree. The Christmas tree is powerless, especially if it's a fake one. <laughs> It's just, it's just this. So do it or don't do it, but don't, don't give it more power than it actually has. So that's a hollow philosophy. But there's also the deceptive philosophies that we need to be mindful of. And those are philosophies that take our attention and distract us from Jesus. So this angel thing was a big deal. And Paul says, don't, don't get caught up in that worship of angel stuff. Don't let yourself go down that path. Because because angels serve Jesus. <laughs> Jesus doesn't serve the angels. Keep your focus on Jesus. Special prayers. I grew up in a church where, I mean, how you prayed and whether you spoke in tongues or whether you did all this stuff, it really mattered. Like, were you really a Christian if you didn't? That's the Jesus and stuff, by the way. And Paul says, don't, don't let them do that to you. Don't let them make you feel less than because you don't, you don't, you don't celebrate the same things they do. And you don't celebrate it the same way they do. Don't let people look down on you because you don't listen to the same teachers that they do. That you don't go to the same church they do. That you don't uh, take communion the same way they do. Those things are Jesus' ands. And what can end up happening is those little things that are supposed to be just expressions of our worship to God become the thing that we worship. And that, he says, is deceptive. That pulls our focus from Jesus, and that is deception. Don't do it. And then he says this thing. He says, listen, in light of the greatness and grandeur of God, in light of the majesty and magnitude of Jesus, those things are so insignificant, not meaningless, but in light of the grandeur of God, you are putting a lot of weight on things that don't really matter for eternity. Now, you've got to be careful with this, of course. There's things that will pull us away from Jesus far enough that we, we are now out of Christ, don't let those things pull you out of Christ. Instead, he says, focus on Jesus. The interesting thing about this letter is, I don't know how you guys write letters. When I write letters, I sort of just say, oh, who am I going to write to? And I say, dear Paula. And I start writing, hey, Paula, how's the day going? Just want to check in and see how John's doing after his surgery. Hope everything's going all right. And my letter sort of meander, and I think of things, and I add those things in, and then I go back to something... So Paul's got a pretty good um, uh, 
handle on how to write a letter. This is something that they do. And so Paul now goes back to something that he alluded to earlier in the letter in chapter 1. So he says this, because Jesus is complete, you are complete as well. He talks about this idea of fullness. And so he says, in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. Now remember, Darren alluded to this, the Jesus that Paul is pointing them to is not a little Jesus. He's not a Lego Jesus. He is he is Christ, the fullness of God. The fullness of God. Everything about God. You may have done this, but this is a I'm off, I'm off right now. Sometimes we talk about God and Jesus as if they are two different things. Th- that is not good theology, and that's not good language. God, this is a little discussion on the Trinity, God is God. In, inside this, and again, again do, not, do not hold my feet to the fire on my description. The Trinity is something that I am still unpacking. But the Godhead is made up of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Together, they make up God. And sometimes we speak as if God is God And then Jesus is sort of his right-hand man. You know what I mean? And Paul says that is not, that's a Lego Jesus. Lego Jesus is God's right-hand man. That's not Jesus. Jesus is God. The fullness of God dwells in him bodily, Paul says. Don't, this God and Jesus thing, that's bad theology. Jesus is fully God. The Father is fully God. The Holy Spirit, fully God. And this Jesus, whose spirit now lives in you, the fullness of Christ is now in you and you are in him. Remember, this is the Christ who who in him and through him and by him, everything came into existence. Everything came into existence. He is the logos, the wisdom and the word of God. He is the voice of authority over everything. Think of something. Try to think of something that Jesus is not the authority over. I'm waiting. Tell me. Anyone? The Bible says Jesus is the voice of authority over everything. Every earthly power, every earthly authority. Now, what is that? That's people. That's princes. That's kings. That's presidents. That's pastors. That's you. He is the authority over every tradition and custom and belief system. If it doesn't align with Jesus, then he still has authority over it. Over government systems, over economic systems, over judicial systems. Jesus is the authority over all of it. All of it. Things seen and unseen. Angels, demons, the force. Jesus is over all of that. He is above all and everything, everything bows to Jesus. If not now, soon. And we have been brought into this. We are part of Christ. We live inside sort of the blessing and the protection and the authority of Jesus over all these outside forces. They can huff and they can puff. But we are inside Christ. Not by the chin of my chinny chin chin (laughs) is it going to affect my heart or my mind or my attitude. They have no hold. They have no control over me except what I release and give to them. You open the door, you let it in. Okay, there you go. Welcome, wolf. But if you say no, 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 I am in Christ. I will not give my attention my thought, my energy, my concern, my anxiety to that out there because Christ is over all. Christ is the head of everything. If it's a good thing, Christ is the authority over it. If it's a bad thing, guess what? Christ is the authority over it. Amen? He is the head over every power and authority, Paul says. And that changes the way I think about life and especially the things that I pray about. 
Because when Christ is over it all, then I don't have to have Jesus to come in and sort of rescue me from something. It changes the way I pray about my life. We often pray to be delivered from something when God is the one who delivered us into it. I heard a preacher say that one time and it changed my life. We pray to be delivered from something when God says, I I just delivered you into it. I put you there for a reason. James says it's it's so so God can complete the work he's beginning in us. James chapter 1. Most of us know this verse. We don't know it by memory. We know it by heart because it's a hard one. But James says, consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith, this thing God has delivered you into, is producing good stuff. It's producing perseverance. And perseverance has got to work its way through you. you got to learn to stick to it so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So these light momentary afflictions that we go through, they're, they're training us. God's delivered us into them so that he can train us. They help us become disciplined and firm in our faith like those Colossians were. They're part of the redempting work of God in our lives. And they help us grow our roots deep and build us up into this testimony that the world around can see. Listen, cultural winds, the philosophies of the world, are always going to be beating on our door. They were doing it to the Colossians and they're doing it to us right now. Always. Don't be surprised. Don't be shocked by that. It just is. This is the world and the world systems. Don't open the door to it. But you do not need to sit inside Christ and tremble in fear. You don't need to. If you are in Christ, you are secure. Stay there. Stay in Christ. Don't go out looking for trouble. Don't open the door to the stuff. But stay in Christ and you don't need to worry about it. When darkness veils his lovely face, what do we do? We rest in his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, our anchor holds right there behind the veil, within the veil, in Christ. Let the world huff and puff. We are living confidently in this this place, living stones that God is building among us, built according to God's grace. We're living confidently, trusting in his grace, resting in his power. Strong and unshakable in Christ. Amen. Amen? Heavenly Father, this morning as we share in a time of communion, we recognize this unique and privileged position we have in you. A place of peace and of joy. That even when life is difficult, we know you are over it all. Even though we go through times of trial, with our physical well-being, with our economic well-being. We get anxious about our families. We get anxious about our futures. And forgive us, Lord. Teach us instead to trust in your grace and to rest in your power. Accomplish your purposes in our lives through every means at your disposal. In communion, we recognize that we... We are not the center of the story you are telling. You are. Thank you for bringing us into it, allowing us to be part of what you're doing, redeeming us for your glory, Christ in us. The hope, the hope of glory. We thank you for Jesus. Who has chosen to love us. Thank you for your grace. Amen.
It is so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take Him at His word Just to rest upon His promise Just to know the saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. And I'm so glad I learned to trust Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that Thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him all. be seated. We have an opportunity to um, reflect what we believe about Jesus being Lord of all and authority over everything, Amen. and that's our finances. That's an awkward thing to say, but if you think about it, it's true. So just think about that, and uh, we have this opportunity to give back, and so let me pray. Father, thank you for uh, the opportunity to participate in your life and to show our trust to you by what we give today. And um, it's really, really hard in a world where so many of us have trouble uh, meeting our monthly responsibilities to trust you with it all, but give us the grace and the faith to do that. And we thank you uh, that uh, we um, are a church that is generous and reflects your generosity. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have several announcements, so we'll go ahead and start uh, as they begin taking up the offering. Uh, Carla, up here at the front, uh, is our preschool director. And I was uh, pleasantly surprised the other night to hear how many students we have. And we're having an open house on Tuesday, February 13th from 6.30 to 7.30. I think this is for finding out about next fall, right? So if you know anybody that you think would be a great student uh, to be in our preschool, point them to that. So it's next or Tuesday, February 13th, a week from Tuesday, 6.30, 7.30. Uh, take a tour, meet the director, ask questions. Now, on two weeks from today, February 25th, there are two things going on at the same time. One is joining God's family, and that's a, a class for children and parents to answer the questions about baptism. There, there will be lunch provided, and we'd like for you to register online. And to do that, this little guy here that you got has a U, um, QR code, or you can go to the website slash kids, and you'll find it there. At the same time, uh, 1130 on Sunday, February 25th, Tim and I are going to be teaching Sherwood Oaks 101, which is a class that's just basically what we, how we do church, how we understand scripture. We will also talk about baptism. We'll talk about the membership, partnership, 
and all those things. So if you're an adult wondering about those things and you don't have kids, uh, you can come to that. We offer this, what, two or three times a year. So some of you have been through it. Uh, so that's, that's that. And lunch is provided for that also. We would like for you to register so we'll know how much to, to get. Now, we're going to have a Monday Thursday service here on March 28th in the evening. And we're going to have a choir. And so Becky is uh, going to have a choir rehearsal on Thursday, February 29th at 6.30 to prepare for that. Thomas, where are you? Thomas, Thomas. Man, you should have been up here already. What do you got for us today, bud? Hey, good morning, everybody. If uh, you don't know, because I don't say it enough, I'm on the men's leadership team with uh, Darren Swango, who's up here for prayer time, Shannon Phelps, and Chris Burns. I don't know if Chris is here this morning, but... Um, oh, look at that. It's right there. So this is what I'm here to talk about today. If you're a man and you want to get involved, it's not just service. There's events, fun stuff. We just had breakfast at Apron Strings yesterday. Text this number, rooted, right there. 812-324-8644. You'll get a one-time text back, and then anytime um, we want to put out any information to you, you'll get a text. It's not, you know, um, abusive. I use that word. There's not a ton of ton of text messages that come out. Spam. Not spam. No, we're not trying to, you know, sign you up for an extended car warranty or anything like that. But um, <laughs> so please do that if you're a man uh, here today. We want to involve you. We want to reach out and touch you. We want to. Not in a weird way, but, but <laughs> we want to get involved in your life. We want you to be involved in our lives, so please join us and do that. And then um, it also, uh, so that's just for information. We also have a, uh, an app with a, a group chat that we can get together and we can talk, prayer request, um, more individual, uh, you know, community. Um, we have an app for that. It's called Squad Pod. If you're interested in that, um, we'll be back in the back. Um, at the men's toolbox back over there, right over, actually, there's Chris right there, back, back over by Chris back there, and uh, we'll help you sign up for that. We'll text you a link, and you can join in, and you can, you know, get to talk with everybody and get to know everybody a little bit better. So, yeah, that's all I got. Let's give it up for Thomas today. What did I call you the first time I met you? James. I called him James. Like the whole day, you're back and forth out at uh, Bryansville. Bryansville. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Jeff and Erica Barnhill, would you come up here real quick? Jeff's one of our elders, and Erica is the most prayerful person that I know. And uh, so we're blessed to have them. They've been coming on the first Sunday of the month, but it's been a little while. And here it is, first Sunday of the month. So I'm going to ask, and you guys can decide who wants to pray before we stand and have our final song. Would that be okay? Bow your heads with me. Father God, we are just so grateful to be here today in this place, Lord, in this beautiful weather that you've given us amongst these people, um, and just a place where we can worship you and just, um, and just feel your presence. And we just want to ask that as we uh, go out from this place today, Lord, that um, you would just guide us, that you'd be in our hearts, you'd help the message, Lord, that Tim preached today. Uh, that you are over everything. So just sink in, Lord, and stay with us. We love you, we praise you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Come on. 
Working wonders in my heart 